Okay. Okay, welcome. No problem. Okay, guys, let's start. Um, uh, just a few few pointers. One sec. Just uh, I, I've written down a few pointers. The first pointer is regarding. I just want to because remember we did that session on intrinsic value. Okay, in the class. I mean after the class which we didn't manage to record. Okay. Uh, just one more point. I have to. Uh, just want to make sure that you guys understand clearly the time value aspect of it. Okay. If you let's look at the option uh, price. Thing again once again the fly the, the model okay so when we have what, what we have to understand about time value we have to be very clear about time value so let's say what kind of option is this if you look at the call aspect this call let me uh, let me just change this back to 25 let me change this back to 30 okay this call what kind of call is it itm otm or um, ATM the call can you tell me whether the call is uh, ITM ATM or OTM yes Puneet the call, call is OTM what about Aurora OTM why Yeah, one minute. Quiet. Let him answer. Let him answer. Yeah. Yes. Proceed. Okay. Good. All right. Okay. So this is an OTM call. Okay. So an OTM call. What will be the intrinsic value? What will we say mathematically if you want to keep on saying that the option price consists of intrinsic value plus time value? So how should we write the intrinsic value of the OTM call? No, no, no. What should be the value? What value should be ascribed? Because we want to be able to always say that the option price consists of IV plus time value. So we should write it as? Zero and? Yeah, zero intrinsic value, right? So we should write the intrinsic value. What did I ask? Intrinsic value, right? I asked for intrinsic value. So we should write the intrinsic value of this as zero. Okay, yes. Narotra, are you following? Yes. Okay, what are you looking at? You're also looking down. Okay, you can maybe put it on. <laughs> maybe you can put it on your desk. Then uh, there is less. It's, uh, it's more stable anyway, right? If it's. Uh, okay, guys. Okay, are you following so far? So we are looking at an uh, we are looking at an OTM call, okay? But is the value of the OTM call zero? It's not zero. The fair value of this OTM call is not zero. Okay, there is some value. So then, what is the time value of this OTM call? What? Thirty days. Days to expiration is not the time value. Time value is a part of the option price. We what did we do that day? So I should have recorded that session. Remember, we did this whole set set of uh, crude oil options. We looked at now. See, these basic concepts are not clear. Uh, one minute. Where are the option trader? Let's launch the option trader and see once again. Maybe we can do this session quickly. Let's wait for it to launch. What is so complicated about this question? No, 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 no. My question is very simple. We have been discussing this out of the money OTM call. Okay. We are discussing this OTM call and we observe that the fair value of the OTM call according to the model is not zero. Although the IV is zero. The intrinsic value is zero, but the fair value of the call is not zero, right? So what do we know that the option price, okay? In this case, we, if for the purpose of this discussion, we treat the value as equal to the price. We know that the option price is always equal to the intrinsic value plus the time value, right? So in this case, what is the sound? Now my question is with the same call that we are discussing, the OTM call, what is the, uh, I, uh, what is the time value of this call? Is my question clear? It's like asking how tall is the Empire State Building? Some figure you will give me in feet. How long is one kilometer in terms? Uh, how long is one mile in terms of kilometers? 
will give me a number so similarly i'm asking you what is the is the question clear i'm asking you what is the time value of this uh, otm call what is so complicated about it i'm not asking you what it is being affected by i'm asking you what is it i'm asking you what is the uh, what is the time value of the call just like i'm asking you how many kilometers make a mile the value of the time the call option no 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 so we said that for the purpose of this discussion the option op we are assuming that this fair value model we are assuming that value is equal to price for the purposes of this discussion okay okay only for this discussion yes difference between what no no i am asking about time value what is so com com complicated time value is 26 cents because the price of the option the fair value of the option and we are saying that for the purposes of this discussion we will assume that the fair value of the option is equal to the price i gave you that additional uh, clue right that for the purposes of the discussion we are going to assume that the fair value is equal to this is already there in your notes we had the extensive discussion yesterday the other day that you don't go mechanically in fact that link i have given you maybe i should remove that link because that link gives a slightly misleading picture it's actually not misleading it's not incorrect because it's given you two different formula for uh, calls and puts for intrinsic value of calls and puts okay in the case of calls it will be in the case of uh, when there is when there is a positive intrinsic value that is considering only in the money options that particular sheet has given you that particular link that options education website link which i gave you in the note in the notes that says that for the sake whenever we are only now we are only concerned with in the money options how to calculate the positive intrinsic value the non zero positive intrinsic value of uh, in the money options it says you go for um, i mean strike in the case of calls it will be is underlying minus strike and the call in the case of puts it will be strike minus underlying but that's a kind of mechanical way that's why chuk was getting confused when he was doing it okay because he had just looked at the formula and he was kind of saying that's why i told you the conceptual way to understand intrinsic value is that you have to ask yourself whether i can make any non zero positive non zero positive profit by exercising this option this is all written in your notes already okay clearly written in your notes for i don't want to travel up your notes because it will i'll have to take a long time coming back down again okay but if you go back up it is all written clearly in your notes all step wise logic everything is written in your notes that first you have to figure out first you have to see can i make any money by if i do these steps if i follow these steps i will immediately exercise the call assume that i own the call or the put whatever it is i will immediately exercise it that will give me a position in the underlying asset and i will immediately square that position in the market and these set of steps is it going to give me any positive profit or not non zero positive profit or not if it is then only we say we generally in layman's terms we say that this has intrinsic value otherwise we say it's zero if it is negative if it's going to lead to a loss we still write it as zero why do we do that because we always want to be able to say that the price of an option i think we looked at the december that this one now has 8 days to expiry can we maybe yeah we get a little bit of that uh, we looked at some options we looked at of course the thing is that time when we looked at it oil prices have moved up a little bit december was 56 32 three days ago when we looked at it okay now as you can see because london is open also and maybe new york is just about coming in so you can see that the market is much more active you can see the oil futures market is this is west texas oil is getting little more active because normally our classes are a little bit earlier in the day okay so let's look at this now you can see why do we want to do that because we want to be able to say that if you go back here we want to be always able to say are you following so far intrinsic value conceptually that is what don't memorize the formula then you will get confused you should memorize the concept okay every concept also requires memorization but you have to memorize the concept that you have to ask you have to remember what you have to do you have to ask yourself can i make any money if i follow these steps immediate assume i own the option immediately exercise it get a position in the underlying asset and immediately square the position in the underlying asset at the market does this lead to any positive non zero profit okay if it is then that's the intrinsic value otherwise the intrinsic value is zero 
even if it's negative it's a loss then it's a we write it as zero why do we write the negative as zero because we always want to be able to say mathematically that the option price is equal to intrinsic value plus time value so if the option price is 3.5 and the intrinsic value is 3 then 0.5 must be the time value this is clear that's why we want to write that's why if that's why this one for instance this one what is the intrinsic value actually if you compute how much loss will you make if you follow those steps you will exercise it immediately buy the option at 94 and sell it in the market at 85 you'll buy the uh, uh, sorry you'll buy not the option you'll buy the underlying asset at, at 94 and you'll sell it in the market at 85 so you'll lose nine dollars so you could say my intrinsic but we are not going to write intrinsic value as minus nine because then we can no longer say that the option price is equal to intrinsic value plus time value because then the option price will have to be negative if we write like that are you following if we write the intrinsic value as minus nine then if we want to write that if you want to maintain that relationship that option price is equal to IV plus time value then it will be minus nine plus 0.26 so it will have a minus figure but option price can't be negative right okay are you following so that's why because we always want to maintain that relationship that option price is equal to time value plus intrinsic value okay so in this case that we see that the otm call has an intrinsic value of zero okay and so therefore we come we recall the formula that option price is equal to intrinsic value plus time value which means option price and in this case we have assumed that this fair value model output gives a fair value of 0.26 cent of 26 cents so we assume that the fair value is equal to the price so therefore we assume here that therefore we this this will be written as price is equal to 26 cents which is equal to 0 plus 26 cents intrinsic value is 0 plus 26 cents of time value is this clear is everyone following see basic stuff are you following Ganatra? yeah yes so now you know that okay so this intrinsic value of this order otm call is 26 cents okay is this clear if you assume that the price is equal to the fair value okay so this is one thing i wanted to just mention okay two more things to note that um, intrinsic value let's look at let's make notes about this we yesterday that day if you remember we made some uh we made some um, um here you see once again you can see one more time let's look at this here mouse over here what is the underlying futures contract these are futures options the underlying futures contract is the december futures contract for crude oil which is at say 57 okay so when we look at the uh, 59 call what is the intrinsic value of the 59 call when the underlying asset is at 57 what is the intrinsic value of the 59 call when the underlying is at 57 zero okay and but what is the price of the 59 call if we look at it say roughly around 36 36 cents 36 cents okay time value is 36 cents okay now let's look at the 59 put what is the intrinsic value of the 59 put around two dollars okay okay a uh, 1.96 or two dollars let's say so let's say two dot let's take two dollars or 1.95 so you can see here that this the option price if you the, the spread is a little wide over here okay but if you see here if you take this it's two dollars 35 cents so that means that 35 cents time value is consistent between the call and the put okay it will not be exactly equal but it is roughly equal you can see that so in the case of the port you can see two dollars of time value total price of two dollars 35 and uh, the that consists of two dollars of time value and 35 cents of time uh, sorry two dollars of intrinsic value and 35 cents of time value can you see that in real life that option prices are equal to intrinsic value or plus time value yes Tarun what is your question so you said that it is roughly 1.96 yeah because it was around uh, this 59 to 57 0.05 okay. so I said 1.95 instead of 2 okay now we can just take it as 2 so is this clear we saw this yes the other day also which we did not record yes everybody is following Piyush are you following so is this clear to everybody we have seen firsthand that this is happening all right so this is the first point we wanted to uh, note down let's make a note in your notes also time value influences okay 
this I'm not going to write that price is equal to time value it's already in your notes price is equal to time value plus intrinsic value including in the options education flight what are the time value influences what is the number what is can you tell me two important influences on time value which means two important drivers of time value that means if, if it uh, goes if uh, it whatever if it's a directly proportional or inversely proportional what is one of the one minute correct very good okay so two important drivers of time value time value when we say drivers of time value essentially what we are saying is because the time value is being reflected on the on the model output side this is a model the time value is being it the time value is a part of the model output because the price is the fair value is here we are assuming is equal to price but don't lose sight of it uh, in general don't lose sight of the distinction between fair value and price okay because most of your models are fair value models all the models will you'll be doing are fair value models most of them and therefore uh, don't lose sight because i've seen your seniors they kind of don't have a sense of price of market price they are just saying i have done a forecast i have got a figure so you must have that sense that whatever you are getting out is actually a fair value estimate. It really does not mean much because most of the time it's subjective except for the true arbitrage free valuation models which we haven't yet done. Okay, even this is a highly subjective model. Okay, that's why if you notice I have not listed it under, uh, it, it follows AFB procedures but it is actually not an arbitrage free valuation model because this one is a big guess. This is basically just a pie in the sky like one uh, private equity guy was giving an interview <laughs> he was giving an interview about how valuation is done in private equity so he said we take a number and just stick it this is how we do valuation in private equity so the highly subjective uh, assessment okay this option valuation model because this wall input is just basically you just estimate you think you think that it's going to be 2025 but it could end up being anything so this is not really an arbitrage free valuation model okay but here so basically this is a model output the time value is a part of the model output and therefore it is influenced by various types of model inputs various model inputs and two of the most important drivers uh, two of the most important inputs are one is time to uh, days to expiration and the other is the eyeball okay which is the wall input here okay so here you can see it firsthand with 26 cents i'm going to increase the time i'm going to increase the maturity to 90 days see what happens to the option price call option price it's gone up so here we would say that it is directly proportional okay so it is influenced by the so the option price is a fun, or option fair value is a function of among other things inter alia it's a function of the days to maturity and the sign of the first derivative is positive in the sense that the relationship is directly proportional if you increase the uh, we should not make a strong statement like directly proportional because then it goes into linearity versus non-linearity and all that but essentially it is um, if you increase the input it will increase the output okay it's not the reverse okay so the sign of the first derivative that is a more correct statement to make that the sign of the first partial derivative is positive with respect to days to expiration if you increase the days to expiration it will um, increase the value of the option okay this is one we have seen the other big driver of ball uh, of uh, the time value notice that here there is no IV this is still an idle out of the money option there is no IV no intrinsic value okay all right so here we are going to make this bigger we are going to increase it three times so see what happens to the call option fair value 1.449 it has increased dramatically okay so the wall is also another very important factor and you can see that wall is actually a bigger driver the the sensitivity is more actually okay because uh, in the case of days to expiration it's almost directly proportional okay it went up by three times uh, no it didn't go up it went by more than three it was 26 cents it went to about one and a half okay so more than that but this one has an even bigger impact okay all right so is this clear this is a point i want to emphasize as we can see here clearly that asking this basic question exposed the fact that most of you are not most of you are not clear about that okay so now we are clear about it yes, sir.
okay so that is our first topic i'm glad that i covered it because see basic stuff has to be clear basics have to be 100 percent solid if your basics are solid then you can build on it yourself otherwise other you know just keep on building and you know people get young people get very easily swayed by buzzwords you know investment banking and this kind of thing you know, wow this must be really great so and then you start but you have to always be care careful that your in fundamentals must be solid okay all right okay so we are not writing this also because we have already done the exercise okay time value influences um, or let me write it in a slightly better way in influences on time value okay all right now second point now please notice that your your uh, some of we did a lot of trading system calculations in the IPM course but in this course also we have done some like the modeling of the limit price for situations where you are doing active uh, where the decision problem as to where to exit okay exiting at a profit okay if I am buying dollar Canada here okay and I have a stop here maybe then based on my system calculation there will be some decision to make if i buy it here and it doesn't cut my it doesn't uh, go below my stop and starts rising okay then uh, at what point um, at what point do i take profit that becomes an important decision problem and that cannot be decided arbitrarily that should also be decided in a very structured way to be consistent with the other uh, ex ante system planning that you have done okay remember that we did the exercise okay so you must make sure that you are said for your own knowledge okay uh, uh, and you not find these kind of calculations in any book but these are very important from a risk management point of view and also from keep for, for the sake of keeping your own trading very consistent internally consistent your trading has to be internally consistent okay so therefore uh, at what point if it starts rising here 35 36 37 at what point do I uh, take profit okay so that has to be decided in a structured way we have done that modeling that is there but you must integrate everything when you revise make sure that you have the full calculation okay that means you should be very clear about all the aspects how to model the maximum dollar risk per trade how to model the position size given the entry exit dollar risk this that everything all the trading system calculation should be treated as not like if something has gone before in IPM so I'm not going to do it anymore so you should not so you should and then there's one more module which we have not been able to cover yet which is to make you calculate what I am calculating for your system returns your project returns which is your drawdown calculation how to again and then the other part of that is to do your to to complete the learning of this that's why when Golati was asking for can we download the spreadsheet I told him not I won't let you download it because I want you to do the whole spreadsheet from scratch yourself so you must then the other part of the learning is that when you go to your when you go to your calc file the other that's why that uh, you can see it to test your own you can see it to test your own uh, calculations to cross check your own calculations but you must do all this hard work yourself writing it down what is this then writing the spreadsheet program and testing it all this stuff you should do yourself to cement your un own understanding so that's a basically a two-pronged set of exercises this actually can be done as a case one can actually do a case which I gave you also in the I IPM exam we can expand the number of points to be covered in the case beyond what we covered because now we covered the limit price modeling also take profit uh, limit price modeling okay and then an additional so all of this actually there's two parts to it one is to understand the concept for which you don't need a spreadsheet spreadsheet is just comes later for programming okay this is just a programming environment you have to look at a spreadsheet as it's a programming environment that's what it is okay so but for your concept should be clear on paper and pencil itself you should be able to do the numbers on paper and pencil okay so maybe you know big calculations with six decimal you can't do manually you it will take more time but the concept should be clear on paper and pencil first you get all the concepts clear okay what are you doing how to model what is system edge okay what is the gross profit of the trade like here for instance if you remember estimated gross profit we are writing so that we can write gross profit in the same way that in when you look at financial statements they write uh, revenues minus cost of sales that equals gross profit so to be consistent with that I have written gross profit like this which means all losses total losses 
than total profits total profits minus total losses is we have written as gross profit you could also technically argue this should be called net profit because this is actually gross profit this is gross profit and the, this actually this is net profit you could argue this but the reason i've written it as gross profit is because i want to be consistent with the financial statements because all revenues this is basically like revenues returns from all profitable trades is like revenues and re losses on all losing trades is like expenses so revenues minus cost of sales sales minus cost of sales is equal to gross profit so i've written that's why i've written so just to in case you have a question why should, why didn't you call it net profit that's a legitimate question but the reason i've not done it is because i want to be consistent with the financial statement okay so this all these system calculations you should be inside you should be very very fluent at all this okay that system then then this gross profit can another way of writing the gross profit. what is another way of just as a recap what is another way of writing the gross profit is my question clear what is another way of writing the one is of course total profits minus total losses what is another way of writing the gross profit system edge and to the number of trades okay and you know what the system edge is the mathematical expectation of the system okay so that concept also these are all concepts actually this can be written as a case and then the last part which we have not covered so the case for each concept has two parts first you understand the concept conceptually you understand the idea conceptually okay like Tarun was able to crack the IPM one of the few people who cracked that uh, the the R3 question because he understood it conceptually so that is more important just like when I'm telling you intrinsic value don't memorize the formula understand it conceptually how do you arrive at intrinsic value you ask yourself these basic questions exercise the option get a position on the underlying asset immediately square it in the market what is the result positive profit or loss or zero that is what you should remember when you remember once you understand it conceptually you can always do it okay so understanding conceptually for every one of these concepts system edge everything one is understanding it conceptually and then the other part is being able to program it into a spreadsheet so for your own understanding you should then create the spreadsheet that's why i'm not giving you the spreadsheet you can look at it for your own cross-checking but you should create your own spreadsheet that will give you real practice yeah so this is system edge so another way of writing the gross profit is system edge into number of trades yeah let's go back now we have to go back to this because let me go back to jpy this is yours right this is your notes yeah okay so this is also now and the other thing is why am i doing this with um, with currency markets okay now we have a whole bunch of asset classes we could technically be looking at any of these asset classes but this is very big here right so we could be looking at any of the asset classes but why have i focused on currencies for pnl calculations for the pnl calculations that's another aspect of the trading system understand Understanding the trading system, right? You should be easily able to calculate PNL. Okay, is this clear? Yeah, Ganotra, are you following? Yes. Okay. So uh, the reason I've done it in currencies is because the scenarios in the currency markets are the most complicated. If you can handle the currency markets, you can handle all the other asset classes. This, those are much simpler. The currency markets are more complicated. They, uh, the currency markets give rise to more complicated scenarios okay like when your dollar risk capital is in dollars but you're trading in sterling yen then the the pnl calculation itself is a little more complicated so you have to be clear about the the uh, the formula that's why i'm doing this uh, that's why the examples that i've given you are from currencies so once you do the currency market scenarios you can handle all the other scenarios okay let's look at it yes going back so this is where we wrote down the formulae for the different scenarios in the currency markets you can have three kinds of scenarios so these are not written in general terms okay i can write it in general terms but you have to understand it this way that the way to write it pros uh, correctly in general terms because i don't want to be writing in in uh, in the specific these are given in specific examples but they illustrate the general principles let me at least call it out while i'm pointing it out here the first scenario is where your risk capital is in us in a particular currency is in dollars and you're trading in dollar swiss so essentially the the pnl is not being generated in the currency in which the risk capital is denominated because it's being generated in swiss 
and the remember because terms are set always PNL is in terms are set. If you ever forget, yes, sir. Just imagine you are sitting in Gazipur Mandi trading sugar. At the end of the day, your profit is not in sugar; it is in rupees. Okay, so so therefore you will remember that that brings you through the inductive principle that basically gives you that idea that. Uh, PNL is always in the terms asset. Okay, so here what is happening? What scenario two that we are looking? Uh, scenario one. Scenario one is your risk capital is in let's say currency one, but your uh, trade uh, PNL is generated in some other currency other than currency one, because risk capital is in dollars, but PNL is not being generated in dollars. But the uh, market in which you are trading, the dollar is the base asset. Okay, that is your PNL, uh, your risk capital currency is the base asset. This is one type of scenario. Okay, so that's why you divide the the gross PNL by the uh, the uh, exit price. Okay, so this is actually exit price on loss actually. So maybe we should write it as. Uh, but we know what we are talking. We are talking about basically we are modeling the loss here. So this is actually the exit price. Uh, on loss, but doesn't matter. Let's let's keep. No, it is not loss. It's actually more general. It has to be kept as a general because we can use this PNL to calculate profit also. Okay. So in the loss case, it will come out as a loss. Okay. So is this clear? Actually, the more general case, if you look at that example of trading sugar in the Gazipur Mandi, this is your general case. The scenario two is your general case, which you can apply in all the other asset classes, in equities, in commodities, when you're trading crude oil, when you're trading, uh, yeah, because in most of those cases, uh, it's coming out in the PNL is coming out in dollars. The base, the terms asset is going to be in dollars in most of those cases. There will be some examples because there's a there's a cocoa contract in London on which is based in sterling. So you have to be aware of that concept. In that case, you revert to this kind of situation. But this is a more general situation. So the first scenario is in general principles. Risk capital currency PNL is not coming out in the risk capital currency, but the risk capital currency is the base asset in the market which you are trading risk capital currency dollar uh, is the base asset in the market in which you are trading so therefore that's why you divide by the exchange rate by the exit price this is the exchange rate okay second is this clear first scenario is clear yes everybody Piyush, you're clear okay second scenario is risk capital is in dollars and the trading is all us aussie us which means basically it's a general principle is that the general description is that the pnl is coming out in the risk capital currency so here this this particular adjustment factor does not appear you just write the pnl as position into exit minus entry that's why this so that's why i said this is the base case and these are the variations right okay so we'll come to your question i'll just explain it once in general terms okay and then the third scenario is where you have a situation where uh, the not only is the pnl not coming out in the risk capital currency the risk capital is in dollars the pnl is not coming out in the risk capital currency and the risk capital currency is not even a part of the market which you are trading it's not even one of the two assets in which in the market in which you are trading yes yes are you following okay third scenario which is different from scenario two and one okay so now you have to divide by here this I have written is a long sentence but essentially the concept should be clear that you have to divide it by the exchange rate between the terms currency actually it should be terms asset maybe okay maybe let's write it as terms asset more general than a currency because the currency is also an asset but uh, all assets are not currencies but all currencies are assets okay so i've written it as we can maybe just to make it clear we can write both here is this clear the third so what we have to divide so in this particular case when i've got my risk capital in us dollars and i'm trading in aussie yen so when i have my this particular thing if i did not put the adjustment where is the formula for this scenario three did we write yeah the formula is written this part is the divisor is very big the explanation of the divisor is very big so the first part of the formula the top the numerator is the same on the right hand side okay as this same as this but what you divide by is not the aussie end rate okay because that will give you an aussie amount okay you have to divide this by the yen to dollar exchange rate 
okay in this case you have to take, take it by the dollar yen rate you have to divide it by the dollar yen rate this also you should be clear whether to divide or to multiply this also you should work through because that's why all these things because you're not exposed to it these are not very complicated ideas but you're learning them for the first time and there's a lot of detail if you miss one step at any point of time you'll make a mistake if you remember that day when I was also looking at the course, this is a very funny way of doing, of writing equations. We are not accustomed to looking at equations like this. But uh, that day, if you remember when I was tra transferring terms, I forgot to take one, the common device, I forgot to take to the other side. So you make, you can make mistakes, okay? So you have to make sure that at each step, what you're, follow, what you're uh, uh, doing, you have to be very clear. That's why the concept is more important. First, you have to be conceptually clear. Don't try to memorize the stuff. Then you won't be able to do it in real life yes are you following okay so now shochi yeah what is your question now yeah Okay. Because, uh, we don't have the denominator exit price, which we were taking in the election. So how will? How will we so you will have to now. How? What will you do? Good question. Good question. Because we did not cover. Because I gave covered the more complicated scenario earlier. So what is the question? Okay. So the question is. Okay. The question is clearly. Uh, let's be clear about the question. What she is asking is, she is basically going referring back to that limit price modeling which we did earlier. I think where is that here? This is the one. Yes. Modeling the limit price for take profit order. Okay. Maybe we can put it here a little bit. As a function of position size, entry price, and targeted absolute dollar profit on the trade. We have done this equation, but we have done it for a situation where, why did I write this as the first, um, okay, fine, so the first expression is correct. So this was written as for scenario one, okay, this will let us clarify, example for scenario one below, is this clear? If we write it like this, is this clear? Because here we have the scenarios below. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Right. So scenario one below, we have, I don't know why this X is appearing. Okay. So we write, this is basically written as a scenario one. So the way you will proceed once again is you have to start from first principles in your scenario two. Okay. What is your PNL? Now, what is your problem first? Your problem is to figure out the exit price. Okay. So remember, this is the PNL formula for both situations where you make a profit or a loss. Okay. So remember, what does this say here? When you're modeling this, you will obviously need these inputs. Okay. You will need to know the position size. You will need to know the entry price and you will need to know how much profit you need to make. And that also is going to come out of your system calculations. If you remember, so we did some kind of system calculations like we figured that the return on invested capital required by the investor is 113 percent so from there this means that once you compare this to the invested capital you get the target dollar return that you need to make okay what is the amount of money you need to make so you need to make 13 percent on 5 million that's your total profit yes, yes sir. You have to make 13% return on total profit. Okay. Well, actually, no. In this case, uh, the return is 113%. So you need to make 113% on on the um, on your invested capital. So your target for the gross profit becomes 113 113% of 5 million. Right. These are the steps you have to follow. The target for the gross profit becomes this figure has to be 113% of 5 million. Okay. And then you know that this gross profit can also be written as system edge times number of trades. So, so the next step is basically you will figure out what the system edge is. Okay. And from the system edge, you'll have to figure out what the average win will have to be to produce because you will have basically what will you have? You will have system edge into number of trades is equal to gross profit. The gross profit you have already got from the target return on invested capital. Okay. So now you'll put whatever that figure is. Okay. 113 into 5 million. Let's just put it here somewhere, wherever we are going to put it. Uh, I don't know 
where is, this is 180. Anyway, so that is the system. So basically, here you'll you'll figure out basically this 113 and 2. 113 into the invested capital. Okay, this is what you need to make. All right. Okay, are you following? 5.625, which is basically, yeah, we have got this also from that only, from that same calculation. Okay, 5.625. So I need to make 5.625. Okay, so now this is equal to system edge times number of trays. Number of trays, I already have an assumption. Okay, so from here, I can figure out what the system edge needs to be. Now, the system edge formula you already know. Okay, then for the system edge, now you have to write this um, this divided by 180 is your your uh, system edge divided by number of tray uh, is your uh, system edge. Okay, this divided by 180 will be your system edge. Yes, because gross profit is equal. Huh? One minute. Gross profit is equal to gross profit is equal to uh, system edge into number of trades yes. therefore system edge is equal to gross profit divided by number of trades yes. okay so you should have the same figure here we can do it right here we can do this divided by then we have this yes correct System edge is equal to gross profit. Now we know what the system edge is equal to total gross profit divided by number of trades. Now this system edge, if you write this on the left hand side, okay, and on the right hand side, you will have percentage loss into average loss plus percentage win into average win. Out of these inputs or out of the items on the RHS, what is the only one which we don't know? Average win is the one thing we don't know because we know the we know the number of uh, we know the percentage loss we know the average loss already from before we have calculated from the earlier this from once you have these assumptions and the risk capital you know the average loss so we know the average loss we know the percentage loss we all from the percentage loss we know the percentage win what we don't know is the average win so now you have to write an expression to calculate which is also in your notes maybe in the previous course but you have to treat it as a continuum otherwise it will not make sense so the average win you can figure out from this yes, what is the average win that is required in order to produce this kind of system edge yes agree Puneet we can figure it out because only one unknown is there we have only one unknown right so you can look at your notes you'll see the formula we have done all the baby steps this actually you should be able to do on your own but it is still done in your notes in baby steps how to derive the average win how to write the average win as an expression of as a function of the average loss the percentage losers average loss percentage losers and uh, system edge right we have started with the system edge and then worked it backwards with the baby steps calculations and it's all there in your notes the formula is there in your notes right is this clear are you following what is being done Puni? right average win is now being figured out as of because you have everything else except the average win so now you know the average win so now you know basically that to prepare to reduce produce this 113 percent kind of return all your winners have to produce the average win and all your losers will lose the average loss yes all your winners must produce the average win all your losers will produce the average loss okay so now we have the average win the average win is is let's make sure that this has come out of where is this come out of uh, this has come out of some arbitrary figure I guess I don't think it has come out of this exercise okay but you can do that exercise okay and figure out what the average win is okay so you have that average let's assume for the sake of argument that it is 250,000 okay now you need to make 250,000 now let's come back are you for is everyone following so far Aurora are you with us in the discussion okay Aganotra you're following okay your head keeps going down I don't know why <laughs> so okay so um, you're coming now you know this you need to make that return so that target PNL that you have in this case we have taken arbitrarily it has two fifty thousand dollars okay quarter million we have taken it arbitrarily but in fact you have to find out what the actual number is so now where are we scenario two you are going back to scenario two right so Shuchi's question is on scenario two 
so now we are going to write this on this PL side we are going to write that quarter million dollars this is the profit you have to make no 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 yeah it, it is no no you have to produce the average win yeah if you use the R3, then you have to multiply the average loss by the R3. Because your profit target is, so in this case, if we have taken, if assume that the right answer on the average win is 250,000, that is the R3 of 6. Even then, if you take the R3 of 6, what you have to write in this scenario 2 formula on the LHS is 6 times average loss. You have to write it as six times average loss because your goal is to make this profit because what is this expression on the RHS telling you this whatever your position is okay and whatever your entry price is you are worried about the exit price this is what you don't know you don't know the exit price but what you do know is whatever is the exit price it had better give you the target PL on the winning trade because all winning trades have to make the average uh, win all losing trades will lose the average loss right these are some simplifying assumptions we are making this helps us to think in deterministic ways otherwise if you do probabilistic modeling with all monte carlo simulation and all that it looks all very fancy but the point is it could go wrong okay but here we are doing a slightly okay in this particular case as well but where we do the maximum loss assumptions we are taking worst case scenarios so it can't go worse it can't get worse than that if our initial assumptions are correct okay so we are leaning towards these deterministic scenarios so is this clear every so we are making some simplifying assumptions that all winners and this you can control actually okay to some extent at least that if it really goes in your favor you have to make sure that you wait until you get the target profit right you wait until you can make in this case if we take 250 is the correct answer 250k you wait until you get this much profit yes all right okay so you have to write here is everyone clear on the left hand side you have to write the target profit the average win that you have to make because now you are talking about uh, at what exit price should i get out in order to meet my profit target so you have a profit target which is basically driven by your other system parameters and the investors imposed requirement of return required on invest roic that is driving so if this, to make this kind of roic you can't just arbitrarily get out at any point you have to get out at a point which is consistent for with these calculations so therefore you have to make an average win on your lose winning trades and the average win is quarter million here in this example which we have taken so you put the quarter million on this side now this position has already come because when you the position is already known because you have some in this case we talked about entering dollar swiss long at 99.70 and exiting the dollar swiss uh, as a stop okay we had this exit on loss plan at 99 right so we when you're talking about a winning trade and how much money to make if we change this back to dollar swiss okay so we were talking about entering at 99.70 and stopping at 99 okay wherever here it was okay and so this question of uh, now thinking about how much profit to make or what profit what price to exit on a profit it means that you already entered a position and according to the strict rules of risk management if you had entered a position the size of that position also would have been arbit not arbitrarily determined but it would have been endogenously determined as a function of entry price exit price and maximum risk per trade yes okay that is what i've taught you that you should not determine the position size exogenously which many even professionals do it but it's actually not good planning it should come from the risk planning okay so the position size is already known to you because you're why are you talking about taking profit because you put on a trade if you put on a trade you already had a uh, very uh, methodically determined position size which was a function of entry exit and the maximum dollar risk per trade which itself came out of the uh, risk capital and the total number of trades uh, total number of losing trades plus one right the dollar risk per trade remember yes, yes? yes. okay all right so uh, so therefore you already have this you have the position you already have the entry price because you have entered the trade now your only concern is with the, what is the 
to be talking strictly in terms of limit limit orders talking the technical language of limit orders what is the trigger price for the limit order or what is the parameter of the limit order remember limit order has how many parameters one if a market order has zero parameters the limit order has one parameter so in this case if we are talking about this dollar swiss long position it's a limit sell order you have a limit sell order but of course the scenario that uh, shuchi is discussing now is not dollar swiss long it has to be aussie long okay aussie long or euro long euro dollar fx long or kiwi long all the cases where the dollar is the terms currency or cable okay remember what is cable sir in which usd comes in the term currency yeah but what is cable in the spot foreign exchange markets or in the foreign exchange markets gbp upon yes yes gbp not gbp upon usd gbp usd okay USD, exchange rate where sterling is the base currency yes. okay so that is referred to as cable all right okay so uh, so is this clear now so we have this now the only question is uh, where was i actually but anyway so you have the entry price and uh, you have to figure out what is the exit price which has to be done in a way that it has to be done methodically to be consistent with the other parts of the system so now you will just back this out where we have done this i think you can do it because it's even simpler than this it's even simpler than this then the we it's even simpler than the example we did earlier right so this calculation you can do on your own yes okay you just have to write it as what we can we can just do it here quickly mentally so at least we know we at least we are doing it the writing will take a lot of time but at least we are doing it um, orally so pnl is equal to position into exit price minus entry price this is in brackets so open this pnl is equal to position into exit price minus position into entry price our goal is to isolate the exit price okay so pnl uh, minus a uh, pnl plus position into entry price okay is equal to position into exit price and then divided by position is this clear is this correct yeah you can do it either way so it is very simple to do because there is one term less actually that one by exit price part is not there right so you can do this on your own okay so basically now you express the exit price as a function of the of the other variables okay and that's your exit that becomes your trigger for the limit in this case if you have gone long aussie that becomes a trigger for your limit sell order if that will give you the direct desired uh, uh, average win and that will be consistent with your trading so is this clear so all these calculations you can see that they are a little bit slippery so first you have to be very clear about the concepts okay and then uh, you need to be also you need to also practice uh, putting it into the spreadsheet and then cross check your numbers right so that will give you a good the only thing we have not done is to take the return stream of your fund okay that if we if i when i write this as a proper case that will include one more element which is the uh, calculation of drawdown okay remember we talked about drawdown drawdown is basically this if we look at a nice us equity market chart we can talk about drawdown see how the market how strong the market is because there's a lot of positive sounds coming out on the trade agreements so the market is quite bullish you can see how dramatically it's increasing okay right so now you see if you see here drawdown will be basically the maximum peak to trough if you see this not as the spy chart but as your chart of your nav imagine this is the chart of your nav you remember nav nlv in the ibtws that's being shown as net liquidation value but the general term that we use in the industry is nav nav consists of realized profits plus unrealized profits realized profits can all be also be written as cash balance okay so if we are doing this we can write maybe i can actually make, because yeah actually i have uh, reduced the that's why we need a slightly bigger zoom because i have reduced this the overall window zoom okay i think we can go back down here um where are we 711 today 711 yeah 
all trading system calculations okay um, except for drawdown which we have not done okay which I guess I can write but we are discussing drawdown okay max uh, peak to trough equity so NAV in this context we are discussing NAV NAV equal to IBTWS NLV okay equal to un unrealized PNL this member this can be negative also unrealized PNL could be negative also okay unrealized PNL plus cash balance cash balance is also equal to realized PNL okay which can also be positive or negative okay so this is there is all being put down in your own notes file okay realize PNL so NAV is what NLV the more general industry term is NAV and uh, net asset value but IB calls it net liquidation value okay so concept is the same and so that consists of your unrealized PNL plus your cash balance which is basically reflecting your realized PNL is this clear Sir. so yeah yeah so I have a question regarding scenario 3 one minute so let's go back to um, JPY good yeah so short trade so you're talking about modeling scenario of trade PNL for scenario 3 yes sir. yeah I wanted to know the impact of Aussie on this formula the Aussie does not have any impact other than the movement of the Aussie N. in this case you're in scenario 3 you're talking about your risk capital being in US dollars and you're trading in Aussie yen so the risk capital currency is not even uh, a part of the market which you're trading is not one of the two assets involved in the market in which you're trading so the impact of Aussie if you're talking about impact of Aussie are you talking about impact of the Aussie US exchange rate yes so like this, this rate has not been used in calculating PLF anywhere no it will be it will be basically what you have to do is you have to estimate here if you're especially if you're talking about both cases exit on loss or exit on uh, uh, so your question is good it's a good point because there is a little bit of a gap there okay when you discuss are we is we are we clear what we are discussing now yes, third scenario where you're trading where your risk capital is in US dollars but you're trading in Aussie yen so in general terms the risk capital currency is not even one of the assets in the market in which you're trading Yes. okay because remember a market is a venue for exchanging one asset against other uh, exchanging assets basically you have two assets in a market okay so therefore here in this particular example risk capital in dollars and trading in Aussie yen the divisor here basically is the dollar yen exchange rate okay but conceptually what it needs to be is the dollar yen there is you cannot be certain about this rate because it technically conceptually to be correct it needs to be the dollar yen rate at prevailing at the point when the exit occurs whether on loss or on profit okay so if you go back and let's talk about let's call this say Aussie yen if we are talking about Aussie yen all right so if I'm going long Aussie here at 7540 let's say and I've got a stop let's say at 72 okay roughly I've gone I'm going long at 7540 and I'm putting a stop at 72 okay now what I really have to uh, write in that divisor here okay what I need to write the in the divisor here is essentially the the uh, Aussie uh, the dollar yen rate that will prevail for I'm, I'm talking about the loss calculation now for exit on loss part, one side okay then we'll go to the other side I'm not talking about the exit on loss side okay what this conceptually needs to you should be clear about what it conceptually is just like in the capital asset pricing model you have to be clear that one of your uh, exogenous variables that equity risk premium is God knows whose expectation but the it is a forward-looking variable it is what the equity risk premium is expected to be for the future horizon for which you are going to discount the cash flows and that's why you're calculating the cost of equity it's a forward-looking figure it's meant to be a forward-looking figure and what do you normally do you take some historical data and then you use that as the estimate which actually conceptually is not very sound 
it's like saying that what will be the rainfall tomorrow i let me just take the average rainfall over the next uh, previous six months or whatever and that really has no strictly speaking conceptually is not the correct way okay are you following so you have to be clear about conceptually what does the model want this variable to be in this case this model once it's a very good question actually because it leads us to the discussion of this point and this actually is a little bit uh, it's good that you detected it so this this point is a little bit uh, dodgy so you have to be clear about this so in fact what is happening going to happen is we cannot uh, estimate this we cannot actually find out this value correctly because it's intended to be is part of the model when it is written as part of the model it is intended to be the dollar yen your risk capital is in dollars you're trading in aussie yen it is intended to be i'm going long now at 75.40 and i'm putting a stop at 72. so this the divisor here is intended to be the dollar yen rate that will prevail at the time that my stop is triggered because it's intended to give me the loss in dollar terms because my risk capital is in dollar terms my accounting currency is in dollar terms so it is meant to give me the market value of my loss at the time and obviously market value of my loss today it doesn't make sense to talk about it when the market is at 75 40 what is the meaning of my loss when the loss is realized i want to know how much is that loss in dollar terms so it will have to be the dollar yen exchange rate that prevails at the time that your stop is triggered now we are talking about the downside only now we'll come to the upside is this clear is everyone following this teaches you also to think about when you're doing any kind of model you have to think about this also that conceptually uh, are you following the point that we are making here that this part is that's why this question is a very good question because it forces you to focus on the fact that this scenario three there is a little bit of a problem it's wobbly because all these cases we are just able to write the same exit price the previous scenarios there is no problem okay whatever is the exit price that will be the figure okay but here there is a problem because actually it is impossible to know this divisor clearly okay so we have to make a guess just like in eyeball when we are doing an option fair value estimate, we are. This is just a pie in the sky number. I might as well go and ask a rickshawala, what? Give me a number. You know, it is just a pie in the sky number. It has no real meaning. It has no uh, particular weight. Okay. So, um, so therefore, it's it's a it's an estimate. Okay. So this is intended to be. So when you are looking at every model that you look at, you must be clear what are the endogenous variables, what are the exogenous variables. Conceptually, what does the model want this to be? Is it a forward-looking number like in the capital asset? I'm sure. When when you did the CAPM you did not think so deeply about all this that this is meant to be an ex a forward-looking number and therefore it's conceptually unsatisfactory to just take some historical data and uh, most of the time I think people just mechanically apply the data am I right yes, you're just taking the data and applying it right but you have to think that actually it's conceptually problematic because the model it intends it to be a forward-looking estimate so it's actually impossible to know similarly here you see another example of a model where one of the uh, exogenous variables is impossible to know it is theoretically impossible to know what it will be so whatever so you must have this consciousness when you're dealing with models that this is a variable where it is impossible to know theoretically so you should be aware that whatever you're doing for this is an estimate only <coughs> Are you following? So you must have this kind of critical eye when you look at models. Yes. Are you following what I'm trying to teach you to how to think? Yes. Okay. So uh, therefore, I do not know what it is. So I'm going to just look at the dollar yen rate today and just make an estimate. Okay. Maybe I'll take it a little bit below what it is today or maybe a little bit above. So I'm just going to use an estimate. Okay, but at least we should be clear about what rate to use. It has to be the dollar yen rate, but also be aware that you cannot know this properly. Okay, similarly on the profit side, wherever I'm going to exit, maybe it tells me that I should exit at 84. If there is a profit, all my calculations to the system tell me that my TP on this on this trade, entering at 75.40, exiting at 72, the TP should be at 84. Once again, when you come to the calculation of the uh, TP here, okay, you will have to uh, basically when you are trying to model the uh, exit price in this kind of situation, you will have a is conceptually is little bit unsatisfactory because this figure will have to be entered as an estimate. This is an estimate. It's not a clear-cut figure like in the other two scenarios. Is this clear? 
yeah so even here so conceptually what does the model want this divisor to be it wants it to be the dollar yen uh, sorry what is it huh, dollar yen rate the dollar yen exchange rate that will prevail at the time that the Aussie yen goes to 84 and your TP uh, sell limit order is executed who knows what the dollar yen is actually going to be so you are just making an estimate but you will never know this properly it's impossible to know this is also very important because a lot of the problems in finance and economics arise because you'll see i'll give you some videos from warren buffett and uh, actual practitioners like buffett and howard marks and all they are very skeptical about these models because most of these models have these kinds of conceptual problems okay so therefore you should not be too reliant on it it's not like a model in like where the air, air pilot is having a coffee and putting the plane on autopilot because the physics is 100 percent clear physics of flying a plane on autopilot is 100 percent clear the only problem is have is that we can't predict clear air turbulence which is still a problem but otherwise it's clear that's why he can just take it easy but here it's not that clear not at all clear not even remotely clear so you should have this concept also that these uh, these kinds of uh, th there are certain variables which you're using in your model exogenous variables which are uh, it's actually impossible to know this concept should be there in your mind you should be able to see clearly that this is a variable which is impossible for me to know theoretically okay that clarity should be there in your head okay so very good question so that led us to the discussion of this particular uh, problem so when you are modeling this in your this kind of scenario when you are modeling the limit exit uh, the take profit uh, exit price you will have to make an assumption about what the dollar yen rate will be at that time okay so you have to be conscious that you are making an assumption and so therefore you will uh, give maybe in making the assumption itself you will see that if it is uh, maybe you can be a little more conservative or whatever like that you can make some adjustments okay all right but that's what it is okay all right so uh, let's go back to so as I was telling you, uh, Kushbu, this morning, that uh, your your batch, the question quality in your batch is so far the best that I've seen of all the batches that I've taught. The problem, of course, is that uh, the questions are still coming for a very narrow part of the population. <laughs> the uh, questions, uh, I mean, a high percentage of the population should be engaged, but the question quality is actually the best so far I've seen in your batch. Okay so even i remember in in lab also rajan used to ask a lot of good questions so uh, your question quality in the batch is very good okay so where are we now okay we have we have now finished our option discussion okay we are returning to the financial markets module and we must start this topic otc markets versus exchange traded markets now unfortunately the i'm not satisfied with the material in the book it's uh, 1.1 and 1.2 okay but it's not very well written according to me because we need to first uh, we need to basically when we are teaching a new concept to the students we must first make clear the um, the classical distinctions okay clear 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 cut distinctions must be made before we uh, let me explain what we mean by that okay so i'll go to the chapter chapter one okay but i will be using my own notes because uh, it will not come out otherwise properly okay yeah you haven't understood the topic okay so vega versus expiration we are only talking about one part of that okay which is yeah which is yours here yeah all we are trying to say in vega versus expiration is this that uh, longer dated options and so this topic comes up partly connected to the idea of uh, the decision problems related to the expiry of the option uh, when you are going to trade an option you have decided you've already made up your mind that I'm going to be let's say selling a port or buying a call these kind of decisions have already been made you have two more decisions left what is the strike and what is the expiration so when it comes to the expiration the way you decide the expiration is because that's based on theta okay so that's based on theta I don't know where I put the theta maybe I put it uh, somewhere further up that shows the theta as a, uh, a function of um, yeah 
so that is made as a made as a that decision is made as a function of theta but driven by the theta that if you are going to be a seller of options you want to be selling short dated options like this kind of a maturity like here you have eight days this is a good type of option to sell okay so you sell an eight day option anything below 15 days is good but i mean roughly basically we want to be selling options in the short dated uh, uh, maturities and if we and if we are buying options driven by the same logic the same logic basically because short dated options the theta becomes very severely negative we don't want to get caught in that situation when we are long the options and we want to benefit from it when we are selling the options so that basically pushes us when we are buying to longer dated maturities and when we are selling pushes, pushes us to short dated maturities okay all right so what is what is the other one i was saying the, okay so that leads us also to a secondary point to consider okay so we know that if we are a buyer of options we are going to be longer dated we are going to be in the longer dated maturities so for that we just make note of one more relationship which is the relationship between theta and uh, sorry the relationship between vega and expiration okay so we know that when we are buyers of options so what we see first of all when we note the relationship we see that the i don't know if you everybody can see this nine months can you see Puneet? nine months six months three months so what this chart is showing you essentially is that the that longer dated options have higher vega you can test it yourself if you can play around with this okay if you have uh, this this is 90 days you see the vega of this call option is 0.17 okay if we make this 180 days what happens to the vega of the option it increases okay you can play around with this what you should be doing so that you get a feel for things okay so you can see that longer dated options have higher vega and what is vega vega is only showing you the vega is showing you the sensitivity of the option price okay to a change in the wall input okay the option price is the model output okay we assume price is equal to fair value so um, that uh, therefore if, if you change one of the model outputs in this case the wall what will be the impact on the output okay uh, if you change one of the model inputs what will be the impact on the output and that's being given by the vega so the reason we discuss this very briefly this important relationship that longer dated options have higher vega okay that means longer dated options have higher sensitivity to uh, movements in vol okay uh, okay option prices for longer dated options so if you decide to buy options that puts you in the longer dated maturities okay and if you are uh, let's say uh, your view on vol is correct okay because in this case your view has to be bullish because you're buying options okay so if after you go and locate yourself by buying options in longer dated maturities and the eyeball actually moves up then you get a secondary benefit because the vega of the longer dated option is higher than that of the shorter dated option so this is a secondary benefit that you get hmm? but it's a double-edged sword that's why here what does it say double-edged sword because if you go long you're obviously going long because your view on the eyeball is bullish you're going long options but if the eyeball view turns out to be wrong okay like tanya was giving us that example where she went and her underlying view was correct but the eyeball view was wrong okay so if the eyeball view is wrong then it's a double-edged sword because then you get hammered much more because you are in the longer dated maturities because the vega cuts both ways the vega is not just for when you're making a profit it just shows you the raw sensitivity of the option price uh, in in response to a change in the vol input okay so therefore uh, the um, it will cut both ways so only if you're lucky and your eyeball view is correct then you get an extra bang for your buck because you're in the longer dated maturities is this clear now okay is everyone clear okay so i was going to start on uh, let's see how much time we have garvit is not here today but oh, we have seven minutes we have a lot of time so we can make a beginning okay you are taking over for garvit's role yash is taking over garvit's role today <laughs> okay <laughs> all right so let's see now let's what have i given you here in terms of reference uh we are going into our next topic which is an important topic because we have not been able to cover many of the very basic topics in finance because we were constrained by 
um, having to you know give you project specific knowledge but we have covered a lot of material on options yeah. if you can internalize all this make yourself fluent in it then you have learned a lot the only thing you haven't learned is how market makers trade options but I gave you a flavor of that in response to Saloni's question the other day towards the end of that video which gives you the second intuitive meaning of eyeball that eyeball is the market's forecast of future H wall okay and that's an important factor for market maker so you have not been exposed to that perspective you have been using you have been trading options like speculators like directional speculators by directionals like directional speculators you have not been trading options like market makers market makers trade more on the gamma and the delta the gamma okay deciding not to hedge or deciding to hedge etc okay depending on and so their decision making is a lot uh, is driven a lot by their future view on what the h wall is going to turn out to be and remember the market is all the option market is already giving you a answer there all these things here you look at it 29.79 eyeball that means basically these options are saying that these this is the eight day options these are eight day options okay which means basically what this market is saying is that over the next eight days the price movement that will occur the H wall calculation if you do and you analyze the wall, wall figure for the next eight days of movement taking the data in that figure that table 115.1 that we took there were 20 data points here there will be only eight data points but if you take those eight data points and you convert it like we converted in that table 15.1 to an annualized figure that the option market is saying that figure is going to be 29 say 30 percent so if the market maker disagrees with this if he feels that this is too high an estimate that for the next uh, next eight days the market volatility will not be high enough to record this actual figure at the end of eight days the actual H wall figure when you look back eight days at the end of the eight day period it will not be 30 percent if he feels then he will say that the mark option market is overestimating the H fall that will occur in the future this is what we discussed and then he will sell H fall sorry he will sell eyeball because he will sell the options because the options are too rich okay so the option price essentially through the eyeball reflects this is the second intuitive meaning of eyeball that the option price reflects the market's estimate of the future H fall so this is what market makers do so you should also have some flavor of what the market makers do okay uh, this is what they do okay maybe uh, we can um, when instead of I'll just do this one. Yeah. Yeah, it's an eyeball figure. Hmm? Oh, sorry. I may have said H fall because I'm going up and down with so many uh, using the word so many times. So it's an eyeball. This is an eyeball. Yeah. Okay. Right. So maybe what we can do is maybe I think because you guys have not understood this point very clearly. Maybe just to uh, illustrate this point, maybe then I'll cover the uh, exchange traded markets versus OTC markets uh, next time because we uh, we have only three minutes left. Okay, so if we look at, um, I don't know if it will actually. Uh, this place is this page is not blocked okay you see this eyeball and H fall chart together okay uh, Microsoft etc this actually is is they are just plotting it concurrently okay so when the uh, market maker looks at eyeball here is around say 15% okay if we look at this the eyeball is 15% okay and the current H fall is let's say these are 50 day 30 day eyeball the current H fall is 18% you can see that here 18 and a half percent the current H fall is around 18 and a half and the current eye wall is around 15 percent so if the market if the market maker see the eye wall essentially 
the second intuitive meaning of eyeball is again what this means is that this is saying the market the option prices option prices essentially the eyeball is the index of the option price right <laughs> that's the first intuitive meaning of eyeball that the option price market is actually uh, essentially trading in eyeball okay through the option prices it's trading in eyeball okay and so the markets the what is the markets eyeball uh, estimate which is basically coming out of the market prices what does it mean 15 uh, 1% 15.7 uh, let's say 15 percent let's say 15 percent eyeball for 30 day options right now what it means is that the according to the options market th uh, that if you jump forward 30 days from today okay if you jump forward 30 days from today and then look back and calculate the previous 30 days uh h ball using the previous 30 days data which is basically from today if you were to use if you were to know what will be the future 30 days um, price data and calculate the H fall from that that figure will come out to be 15.17 okay so when the uh, when option market makers trade in uh, basically they take views on Delta they, they may not hedge their Delta exposure okay they may not hedge their gamma exposure okay they may or they may not they take views on how this is totally driven by how dramatically the price moves okay this is totally driven by how dramatically up and down the price is moving okay so they are going to take a v and this is also how dramatically the price is moving is also going to affect the h wall calc remember you saw how the h wall is calculated if there is a lot of movement up and down you could actually end up with very high h fall figures so the mark the market maker essentially what the what he does the option market maker looks at the eye wall figures today okay and he takes a view on what the h fall will look like see right now the h fall is 18 percent he will either take a view that h fall is going to be dramatically higher in the next 20 30 days it will be 25 percent or he will take a view that this is going to completely collapse it will go down to 10 percent i'm giving extreme examples so if he thinks it's going to go down to 10 percent over the next 30 days the reading will be 10 percent then this 15 percent is nothing but the market's estimate of that future h fall that's too high an estimate so the option market is through the option prices the op that means the option prices are too rich they're too expensive because the eye wall that is coming out of the option prices is giving me a forecast of h fall which i think is too high so if the option market is kind of uh, overvaluing the uh, estimated movement okay then i'll be a seller of options because it's too rich okay i'll be a seller of options okay and i will hedge myself accordingly in the underlying market which is a complicated process but this is basically what the thinking that market makers go through and similarly on the other side okay that if he feels that it's going to actually be 30 percent over the next 30 days then he looks at the option market pricing it as 15 percent then he thinks that options are too cheap relative to what i think actual h wall is going to be okay so then he'll be a buyer of options this is what market makers do so that itself that becomes like another project how to manage delta and gamma exposure in this project you have only looked at vega so i'm a little bit one minute over okay uh one one point two minutes over uh, no we have seen that wall charts are actually a little bit mean mean reverting compared to the spot okay if you look at the optionistics charts okay you see long term wall data you see that the wall charts are a little bit more mean reverting than the than the underlying charts okay uh, but uh, in this case it's not necessarily anything to do with mean reverting in this case it's just he's saying that the uh, the option prices reflect the, the through the eye wall they reflect the forecast of the future h fall so if the and the and the market maker will essentially be trading in the h fall he will be experiencing the h fall through his hedging okay so he will think that he will make a forecast of what the h fall is going to be and if his forecast is much lower than the current option prices he will sell it because the eye wall embedded in the option price is the forecast for the future h fall okay so it's as if somebody is saying that you know for the next 30 it's just like if somebody is saying in the money markets that average overnight rates for the next one month is going to be 15 percent if you think that actual overnight rates are not going to be 15 percent let's say you're on the money market trading desk then you will what you will do is you will lend him money what did i say 15 percent 
so if think about it this way if this is what the option market is saying next 30 days h fall is going to be 15 percent it's just like any guy on the money market desk saying that next 30 days average overnight rate borrowing rate will be 15 percent but if i feel that average overnight borrowing rate will only be seven percent what will i do i will lend him money for one month so i will say okay you borrow money from me at 15 percent for the next one month and what am i what am i going to do to hedge myself i will borrow every day on an overnight basis i have lent him money on a monthly basis one month money so every day i need to have money to lend to him are you following because if i'm lending him money then every day i need to have money to lend to him i've already lent him for 30 days but i make a forecast that average overnight rates will be only seven percent so based on it's a view of course it could go wrong but what i'm going to do with this view is every day i'm going to go into the market and borrow let's say i've lent him 100 million so every day i'll go to the market and borrow 100 million and if my view is right my average cost at the end of one month will be only seven percent are you following this is exactly what the option market maker is doing that he is looking at the uh, eyeballs that are embedded in the option prices today and he knows that the eyeball is a forecast of the future h wall and if he feels and he takes a view on the h wall that is going to happen in the future and so if the market the eyeball is higher than his forecast of future h wall he will be a seller of options if it is lower than the future of uh, than the future h wall that he thinks then he'll be a buyer of options just like this money market example and actually money market traders do this this is called maturity mismatch uh, you know misma uh, maturity mismatches okay so many money market traders will be doing this they will be lending money if they feel that the money one month rates are too high compared to the are you following this that the same thing if i lend yash money for 30 days and every day i go to sg1 and borrow money i can still uh, i can still satisfy the funds that i have to give to yash because every day he's lending me money but my total cost is the average of all the daily rates which may be lower or higher than the flat rate that i quoted to yash is this clear are you following exactly the same concept yes. and this thing also happens on the money market desk okay all right okay so we have taken up a lot of your time but uh, at least you got some more clarity so next tomorrow we must cover the uh, we at least we must start and hopefully we can finish this topic we'll have an extra because we have a lot of material to cover in the next course also okay all right okay <laughs> yash is not happy with the money i lent him <laughs> that's why now press only pause because we see some of the questions that come up. okay where is this your question is about the book references yes, sir. so i'm referring to let's say when we cover otc markets as et markets. so if i have only this 1.1 okay. 1.2 that means you have to read these segments so you have to go to 1.1 and maybe you should read this yeah 1.1 exchange traded markets 1.2 over the counter markets so this okay. will not be coming in an exam right in fdi exam no if i cover it whatever i cover in the first in the 20 sessions that yeah. then it will be part of the exam depends so depends on what i cover if i'm uh, if i cover it then it's part of the exam it part of the syllabus if i don't cover it then it's not part of the syllabus okay so tell tomorrow what you have covered will be the part of the syllabus ah, whatever i covered till uh, whatever i cover till the end of the course that's all part of the syllabus and what other book references are you talking about like h wall say in the h work h wall calc let's say yes, sir. in h wall calc yeah, in one way when we are looking at this topic yes, sir. okay um calculation of historical wall that's our topic so what am i saying here page i'm saying hp section 15.4 okay. this page number may or may not be correct okay. this editions change soft copy hard copy but this is correct okay. the section is correct so you have to find section 15.4 okay, yeah this is clear yes. so these are the book references yes, yeah okay Any, anything else okay